I'm honored to be here tonight. Um, I wrote this story that I'm about to read um, about my experience with Lucille Ball when I was homeless. Because I was kicked out really young. And I lived on the street for a while. And I survived beautifully because of this woman, Lucille Ball. And she was a very uh, tortured soul. And I'm going to share the story, and thank you, Michael, for asking me to do this, and, and everybody. Um, why is it so fucking hot in New York? <laughs> I, I, I just can't believe it. This is like, we get it. Uh, do I need my glasses? I'll wear my glasses. I'm old. I'm old. No, I, you're not. Oh, my God. I remember when Pride was on a mud lot. <laughs> <laughs> I do. Gay pride in Los Angeles in the 70s was on a mud lot. <laughs> so this is an interesting story, and you'll get some insight into what it was like to be me at that time. Woo! Lucille Ball was my acting teacher every Tuesday at 7 p.m. for eight weeks in the fall of 1977. She taught me that I better know my lines, I better be prepared, and I better show up early. <laughs> Lucy taught us how to play drunk. Say every word slowly and clearly. Drunks don't want you to think that they're slurring. <laughs> and know your props. Everything you saw me do on I Love Lucy was practiced and rehearsed for days. Her tone was serious. No more pictures of my color. When I'm channel surfing and I see America's favorite redhead, she connects me more to a world that's black than white because I was a witness to her wounds. It was the year of Saturday Night Fever before AIDS, before gays. There were only 13 channels. Hollywood Boulevard was an old-fashioned street. They were old ladies with Andrew sister hairdos that walked down the street in ancient silk dresses. Male hustlers clogged the ice cream store at the corner of Las Palmas Avenue. I was 19 years old. It was, I was lean, I was mean, and I had a shag. I also had a job. At the Sherwood Oaks Experimental Film School, on the corner of Hollywood Boulevard and Ivar, upstairs from a Tom McCann's shoe store that sold only platforms that year. I rode, to my, I rode my bike to work from a small apartment on Van Ness Street that I shared with a dwarf actor that I met in an improv group. My only complaint about my, room, my new roommate was that he left footprints on the toaster. When you live with a little person, everything becomes a step. <laughs> <laughs> Working at, a, at the Sherwood Oaks Experimental Film School was my first job after high school. <coughs> the reality is I was homeless. The school's yellow linoleum floors were sprinkled with discreet remains of well-smoked joints. A signed poster of Taxi Driver was taped to a shiny yellow wall. Just above two well-worn sofas were student groupies and visiting professors often made love in the wee hours. One of my daily tasks was to read the celebrity service and to be on the lookout for what celebrity Gary Shusette, our teacher, or the head of the school, would want to know and who was in town. I would say, Louis Maul was at the Beverly Wilshire. He would tell me, looking up from the paper, call him. I called the Beverly Wilshire, I asked for Louis Maul, and then Louis Maul would come down and share his insights into the craft to the next generation of artists. Now, it's hard to believe that people, no less celebrities, would show up and share of themselves practically for free, but we're talking about the late 70s, a very rare time when Hollywood's excesses were eclipsed by hippie decor. And above that chain store, the who's who of people like Warren Beatty, Robert Town, George Lucas, these people came to our school seeking to impress us with their lack of display, their absence of possession, except, of course, for amazing crocodile boots and turquoise. For a short time, it was I who would go down and greet them. On one stiflingly hot afternoon, Leslie, a pleasantly overweight girl who also worked at the school, ran into our cluttered office. Lucille Ball just walked into the optometrist's office on Ivar. What? Gary stood up and then disappeared out the door. Leslie followed. Then Gary reappeared moments later, smiling and confident, looking like a cat that swallowed the canary. Lucille Ball is going to teach a course here. He's right. I was there, Leslie said, 
Lucy was going to do eight two day, Tuesdays. And my mind reeled. Lucy Ricardo was going to teach here. I asked Leslie if she was nice, and she said, <laughs> she's stern. A few moments later, a few months later, Lucy's sold out class began, and over a hundred eager wannabes paid their hundred bucks to pack into the studio. There was a buzz in the air, and I could barely contain my excitement, and Gary was very straightforward with me. He handed me a list of items to pick up for her green room. Lucy requested a pack of Pall Mall non-filtered cigarettes, a bag of chocolate pogans, and a bottle of scotch. <laughs> I, I, I can't get alcohol, Gary. I'm not 21. Well, okay, I'll get that, and you get the rest. I raced back and forth to the local convenience store, and I placed all the items on a Formica table, and then Gary put down a bottle of Shivers Regal, and then he asked me to go to the alley and get Lucy. I was thrilled to be given such a task. And at precisely 6.45, a green country squire station wagon with wooden doors appeared, and a portly, serious man got out. This was Howard, who ran Lucille Ball Productions. He shook my hand. And then there was a moment of hesitation before I realized that something was about to be revealed to me, and from where I stood, I could see Lucille Ball. She was sitting in the passenger side of the car, attempting to apply her makeup. Her hair was pink, pink like the inside of a flamingo's hairbrush. I have never seen hair that color again. And it distracted me from the moment, the bizarre fact that Lucille Ball was crying. Lucille Ball was bawling. She was wiping tears from her eyes, and I watched her struggle to fill in this large stencil of mouth that had been drawn on her face for countless close-ups and magazine covers, that pinky orange lipstick obliterated very thin lips. I spied her take out a bottle of Vaseline, open it, and then put the stuff all over her teeth. And then Lucy got out of the car. She was taller than I expected, and she wore an orange polyester pantsuit that flared at the foot. I imagined her in black and white polka dots or a smart cocktail pajamas, but I wasn't prepared for this Lucy with no makeup, no false eyelashes on swollen blue eyes, this human sad Lucy standing before me in the hazing, fading Hollywood light. Lucy darted in front of me as though she knew where she was going, and then I followed her up the backstage through the throngs. She walked over to a director's chair and the audience stood on their feet and they cheered for Lucy. They cheered for themselves. And this collective ovation of celebration was something beyond their comprehension because in that room like bees, deliriously sucking up pollen from a very bright sunflower, they celebrated Lucy's offerings of undistracted happiness. And Lucy seemed slightly disturbed by this adoration. Her face was like a snake that had come up and out of a curl. An ancient creature suddenly awoken by an oncoming stampede. And then she sat down, looked at, out at the crowd, and she began to cry again. A hush came over the room. Some people thought it was a gag and laughed nervously. But I knew it wasn't. And then Lucy spoke. The kindest and the most lovely woman in the world died one hour ago, Lila Rogers, Ginger's mother. The class was flabbergasted to witness such an unexpected show of raw emotion. We hung on Lucy's every word. There was a rage in her voice. And then she continued, in the early 30s, women came to Hollywood, and when they got off the train, they were met by men who were impersonating agents and executives who offered them rides home, and these men raped these women. The word unleashed fat tears. And Lila Rogers created the Hollywood Studio Club, a place where young women could come and be safe from these rapist men, because in those days, when a girl was raped, never mentioned. Uh, she was disoriented, and her lack of self-control embarrassed her, her, and Lucy's face contorted into a mask of pain. Her intelligence was keen, and after a few moments she composed herself and looked out at the crowd like an old pink gorilla. Lucy was one of those girls. Lucy had been raised. 
this class was not going to be, be about fight and meet the Benjamin. Yeah. Candid, frank and rough voice, Lucy pointed out to students who dared put up their hands. Girl in the black sweater, boy in the paisley shirt. Most of you aren't going to make it in show business. Most of you aren't that good. <laughs> she inhaled and then picked bits of tobacco out of her teeth and flicked them into space. The older member of the crowd laughed uncomfortably. The younger members became sullen. There isn't enough room for you. You have to be honest with your chances. I didn't do the pilot for I Love Lucy until I was 41 years old. And then she lit another Paul Mall. And I remember thinking, 40 sounds old. <laughs> Desi and I knew it was our last chance. She inhaled deeply, and she smiled when she said the word Desi. We had a sponsor, but the network balked at the idea of me having a spick husband, and she hit the word spick. And they refused to put up the money for the insurance policy we needed in order for that show to be filmed. So to pay for that insurance policy, Desi and I had to take out a second mortgage on our house. That house was all we had. If that show failed, we would have lost everything. Mm. I would have had to move back to Jamestown, and Hollywood would have been over for us. Mm. There was something brutal in her tone, as though she'd never gotten over the injustices. And she said, for days, Desi and I stewed over the decision of butting up the house's collateral. And then one night, she told us that she fell asleep completely exhausted. And in the middle of the night, Carol Lombard walked into her room. I knew it was a dream because Carol had been dead for six years. <laughs> Carol walked right in my room and sat on the bed. Lucy spoke with urgency. Carol was someone who I looked up to a great deal when we were at MGM. She was married to Clark Gable. She died. Her plane went down in an ice storm over Nevada during the war. She was selling war bonds and her voice softened. In my dream, she looked wonderful. <laughs> Lucille Ball was taught by the studio linguist to speak in a clean, arless, mid-Atlantic accent. Lucy did not say wonderful. She said wonderful. You can hear it when you watch that show. And when she says that, it gives me a sense of hope for all the things in life that are wonderful. And then she started to cry. Carol looked at me and said, mortgage this house, Lucy, sign the papers. This is what you want. Sign the papers and you'll be free. And then Carol Lombard walked out of the room. And Lucy signed the deal. And in return for doing so, CBS gave her and Desi full ownership of the footage. And the both of them became richer than any of them could have ever imagined. All because of the words of a ghost. Years later, I recall watching a biography of Lucy where a colleague remembers Lucy and Desi having a fight and Lucy standing over Desi with red nails inches from his face saying, I wish you were dead. I could see her doing that. When someone in our class asked Lucy what it was like to be the most famous woman of the 1950s, Lucy took a long time to reply and she said, I didn't know until the 1960s. I was too busy driving over Laurel Canyon twice a day to notice. Lucia Ball drove herself to work. I imagine Lucy walking out of the soundstage in one of those foggy LA nights, looking for her car, fumbling in her purse for her keys, shifting in reverse and disappearing into traffic far away from applause signs and key lights, her mind pummeled by the hard black rain of the past and her heart filled with the sorrow and rage from midnight spectral visitations and all those raped struggles. Lucy only wanted a home with kids and a husband who stayed close by, and what she got was a white mansion where the phone never stopped ringing. There's a large old house on the corner of Royal Canyon and Lookout Mountain Road, and whenever I drive through the haunted canyon and I have the opportunity to stop at the red light there, I think, Lucy stopped here. Sometimes stoplights can provide the necessary punctuation, a period, a moment in time to stop and connect our past to our spot in this present. And I think Lucy looked at that house when she was driving around a simpler world. Lucille Ball, and all the bad things that happened, 
created hilarity from darkness. She was in the middle of it. She just connected the dots to the days. Lucille Ball hit a chord, and Lucy Ricardo hit a key. And that's why we like Lucy. For hers is the music of someone slightly humanized. We have all been humanized by what we have had to go through. And in that yellow linoleum room on Ivar in Hollywood, Lucille Ball taught me to pay attention to the plain space I inhabit and handle the reins of our dreams with care, because if we don't, accidents of destiny and catastrophe of success can occur. And ultimately, we are responsible for what we become. And she also told us that her favorite episode of I Love Lucy was when she went to Hollywood and met William Holden. She said filming an episode, something very unexpected and dangerous happened. She was disguising herself with a putty nose, and when Ricky lit a cigarette, the nose burst into flames. <laughs> and if you watch that episode, you'll see all the actors react in absolute, honest horror. And I'm still transported to a state of gleeful anticipation when she arranges the putty on her face and she improvises the line, this California sun sure makes your skin soft. <laughs> <laughs> I imagine when she was doing this, immersing herself in her work like we all do, like we all are, we forget, like she did, her pain. And when we watch her or any comic we are distracted from our own. And this is wonderful. Mm.